since I was three years old. I don't remember much about anything before that. Of course, he was still in in the military, but I don't know where. Mm -hmm. So, uh, basically, in 1949, Dad sent, and we got got on a troop ship, no luxury liners, and moved to Japan. The whole family? Just me and my mom, yeah, what? that's it. And uh, we lived in an old Air Force base called Grand Heights, just outside of Tokyo. And I do remember that, and I do remember some of the things that Dad would take, take us to, and things like that. And then a year, less than a year later, the Korean War broke out. And so they evacuated my mother and me. Well, back to the troop ship, you know. Now these are World War II troop ships. These are not, you know, you're in a little bitty cubby hole with pipes running all through it and everything else. But it was, so we came back from that. And then in 1951, Dad got back. He worked in MacArthur's headquarters there at, in Japan. And uh, I do remember uh, that when MacArthur would come every day, he had prayed every day to come to work and go home. And uh, on the top of the Daiichi building, which was MacArthur's headquarters, there was a bar. And sometimes me and my mother would go in there. And after Dad got off work, we'd go up there. And then in the home, he didn't have a car. So I don't know if we took a bus or if they shuffled him. I don't remember how we got around. I do remember they had some. Uh, Japanese cars, and they'd stop in front of you for some reason, and the guy would get out and throw pieces of wood in the back. These cars ran off of wood, and stepped like hell, and smoke everywhere, but that's one of my first memories. So anyway, when Dad got back, he was stationed at Fort Missoula, Montana. And of course, I didn't know this at the time, but Fort Missoula was a really big uh, POW camp mostly for Italian prisoners. And they had a big hospital there. And they only had, they had some troop quarters and then they had like five officer quarters, uh, probably from the 1800s or something, two, two story buildings. And dad was still a, a master sergeant then. And we, uh, we lived in one of those big two-story buildings. And since the duty got passed around in the wintertime, we'd have to go shovel coal for each one of these buildings. And so I, Dad would nudge me and, okay, let's go shovel coal. And so we'd go shovel coal and all these things. And of course, then he'd go to work the next day. And the hospital was all shot down, shut down and vacated. And I don't think there was more than 50 people assigned to Fort Missoula at that time. I don't have any idea what they did or why it was even there. And then we got stationed at Fort Lawton, which was right up the hill from uh, Ballard in Seattle. And so it was only about a 10 minute drive away. And, uh, I don't remember much. I started school then, uh, then and uh, dad, dad, dad worked up at Fort Lawton. And then the big, big thing came in 54. Got, dad got assigned to Germany. And uh, we had to wait until he could find a place for us to live over there. So for about four or five months, me and my mother we moved back to Butte and waited. And when we finally moved there, Dad was assigned to Birch's Garden, which was a uh, beautiful place. That was where Hitler had his eagle's nest and his house. And he worked in Hitler's headquarters. Hitler had, he had the Berghof where he had all his houses and stuff like that. But down right outside of Birch's Garden, like half a mile, there was a complex, and it had a big office building, and one, two, three, 
houses and a big underground tunnel complex, which uh, when the Poles got there, they tore it all apart looking for gold. But Dad had the key, so we could go down in there, and as long as you watched where you were walking and didn't fall in any holes, you know, it was interesting. And uh, eventually we moved into the one of the single houses next to the headquarters building. Dad worked in the office right next to Hitler's office for the whole time he was there. And uh, we moved in a house Edda. House Edda was made by, uh, built by Goring for his sister, and named, named after his sister. It was a big place. It had full basement with uh, uh, quarters for all the staff. It had, uh, complete with kitchen, bathroom, and everything else, 1940, not 3940, it's not the fanciest stuff in the world. And then up top you had the big living room area, full dining room and kitchen. And then upstairs you had like four or five bedrooms. And then upstairs in the attic you had two rooms. And uh, so it was a big place. And uh, eventually it became uh, the Yodel House and used to put officers in during the war when they were visiting down here with, with Hitler, I guess. Then in 58, as much as Dad tried to stay in Birch's Garden, I mean, this was a wonderful place. Uh, they said, no, just like me. They said, no, I can't do it. You're going to go to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, which is San Antonio. And uh, During that time, or just before he left Germany in uh, 57 uh, or 58, or when he got to Fort Sam, one other, he took a commission as a captain, which was interesting because in Dad's career, he was every rank from Private E1 to Master Sergeant. They didn't have sergeant majors back then. To warrant officer one, warrant officer two, warrant officer three, captain and major. He hit every one of them. Except lieutenant. Huh? Except lieutenant. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Good catch. Yeah, he never was a lieutenant. Uh, but uh, anyway, he worked at uh, an old compound there at uh, Fort Sam. And uh, let's see. Did he have to go to Korea? Well, he did later. Oh, he did. Uh, in 1960, we were stationed at Eilson Air Force Base in Alaska, about 50 miles south of uh, Fairbanks. And basically, I think the Army had. The Army comp component there was uh, Nike missile batteries around the Air Force Base. And then uh, in 1961, we moved to Fort Wainwright. What happened was Ladd Air Force Base at Fairbanks, they gave it to the Army and it became Fort Wainwright. And so we moved up there. Uh, at Fairbanks until uh, yeah, the end of 62 or something like that. And then for some god awful reason, he got orders to New Orleans, Louisiana. So we moved from Alaska to New Orleans. And uh, there was a small army camp there called Camp Leroy Johnson. Once again, it was like Fort Missoula. There was no one there, maybe 100 people at the very, very most. But he worked down at the port right on the river. It was a big naval facility and stuff like that where military ships come in and out, right in the French Quarter. Hmm. And uh, in 1964, uh, Dad got orders for Vietnam. So that's when my mother and me went to. Great Falls, Montana, because it was a military base, a Maelstrom Air Force base, and we had a form to come back. And 
So after his one year in Vietnam, he come back and was stationed in Fort Lewis. And I was 65. And after that, that's when I joined, I joined the Army in October of 65. So after that, I kind of lost a little, tra uh, a little bit. I th think after that, he went to Korea. He went to Korea for one year. And uh, then after that, they loved Alaska so much, he went to Fort Greeley. And of course, extended there, stayed in Fort Greeley, I don't know, five, six years, maybe. Uh, and then eventually, from Fort Greeley back to Fort Lewis, where he retired, I think in 70, I'm not sure, 72 or so. Uh, might have been 73. But uh, other than that, you know, he had such an excellent career and uh, efficiency reports and stuff like that. The only reason he never retired as a lieutenant colonel is at that time a uh, college degree was mandatory. And so I think that's why he retired. Uh, I think he had 28 years and he said, well, no reason to stay for 30, you know. But uh, like in my case, uh, I looked at it and I could have stayed another couple years, but there was no pay raise after that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so anyway, he retired and then he worked uh, as a military contractor running the uh, MOS libraries where the soldiers could come and check out technical books and stuff like that. Fort Lewis did that for hmm, probably seven or eight years. Huh. And uh, yeah, even when he, he was even doing that when he lived on the island here. And uh, back then gas wasn't expensive, but he, he, had, he bought a moped and he would drive the moped on the ferry and then back gate into North Fort where he worked, mostly sometimes. But uh, he'd do it in the wintertime, idiot. And I found a World War II B-17 uh, winter flight uh, jumpsuit and so he put on that big jumpsuit over his clothes and he looked like a circus bear going to work you know <laughs> he's just a big mass of person on this little bitty moped <laughs> taking off you know. but uh, then, then he retired and of course he did all kinds of stuff out here on the island he was I think he was the only fire commissioner that ever completed a term because everyone else quit and uh, I heard he was quite active in the fire department. He got uh, he got most of their vehicles. Uh, he would he settled up so they could get the military fire trucks, and military water trucks, you know, and they were transferred through magic for a dollar or something like that. And uh, so I know he got a couple of trucks, and uh, boat. I don't know where the boat came from, the Coast Guard. The first boat. They had like three or four boats. They had one boat that was a Coast Guard cutter. This did, thing. Did he use the DRMO process? The what? Dermo? DRMO? Probably. I don't know anything about it. Uh, the Defense uh, Department has uh, auctions every once in a yeah. while where they sell off their excess. But, um, military equipment or stuff that uh, uh, they're not going to use anymore. Right. I, I used to do that. Uh, but of course Dad knew all about that stuff so that's how he and he was very very active in the fire department. And lived in the same house out here that they built. He built uh, he got a chainsaw with an attachment and split logs. When did, when did he first come here? They first started coming out here, I think, in 72. They bought the land, they put in a cement 10 by 10, and then they come out here with, they had a camping trailer, like a 16 foot, not much. But they come out here 
and he would build things like an outhouse. And he'd take these little four-inch logs and split them down lengthwise to make boards out of them. And he built them. First thing he built was the outhouse. Then he built a storage shed. And then uh, he started building uh, more storage sheds. And then when they, they got the house planned out and everything else, he was a fantastic guy with cement. Half of his property, well, the top half of the property is swamp, but the bottom two, two, two and a half acres, I'll bet you half of it's cement because he went, he went nuts. <laughs> he loved fooling around with cement. And, uh, did he have a cement mixer or yep. did he have a delivery? Nope. I think in the end, when they when he finally had the the road up by the by the garage, I think he had White do that. But all of the pathways up and down to the river, I mean to the lake, and uh, no, he he loaded cement, and uh, of course it was it's lo it's quite a slope from the house down to the lake. Mm -hmm. uh, he had me trying to run it wheelbarrow full of wet cement up and down that. Well, it couldn't go up, but if it went down, you may or may not end up in the lake because it was heavy. But, uh, yeah, he, uh, he, he did a lot of cement, he, uh, which is interesting because Dad loved to do things, but he had five thumbs, you know. He would do something and then realize that it's backwards or something, you know. And uh, but he he tried everything. He liked working with. He was really good with a chainsaw. And your mom supported him. Oh God, yeah. Mom liked the island so much, she wouldn't leave. Dad had to go to the commissary for food and stuff like that. She got off the island maybe maybe once a month. She just hated hated to get off the island. And. Uh, she had, well, she probably had a dozen deer, a whole bunch of raccoons, she, a bunch of birds. She fed all the animals. And uh, then when she was sick, she'd have, she'd say, my dad couldn't get her to go, go to the doctor. And so she said, you go to the doctor and tell him this is what's wrong with you. <laughs> and so, that worked until one time uh, the doctor said, well, that's a female problem, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that came to an end. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, she, she just liked the island. She just, and she didn't do anything on the island. Well, she never did anything in the military. Uh, officers, wives, club, and stuff like that. She did the minimum that she could. She just didn't like any of that stuff. And, uh, Well, she was a support for him. Yep. Yeah, well, yeah, her yeah. entire life. And, uh, I mean, moving around as much as you did, and taking care of animals. You know, he always had a dog. And you? No, oh, and me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I got, I got an early education because, hell, I was, I was babysitting myself when I was nine years old, you know. I never knew what a babysitter was. I got, I got stuck on a military had shuttle buses that would go up to the General Walker Hotel way up next to Hitler's house on the Berghof, the, the mountain. And we lived down, like I said, I got stuck on a damn bus and I couldn't get off because I was looking for somebody, kid I was supposed to be watching. And I went up and down that mountain, we're talking about 20 miles up and down the mountain, four times. <laughs> All by myself, you know. Then when the one bus came by and we passed, I saw the little kid, you know. And I'm only t 10 years old. And I couldn't quite figure out how to get off that bus to go get him. You know? but, uh, so I wasn't much of a truck, much of a problem. I, I, they, they set me up to take care of myself. Good. Well, thank you, Bill, for all your information. Okay. Appreciate it. Especially, you know, also being able to do a little bit about Ralph Brasanti that our post is named after. So, 
It's great to have that information. Uh, Thank you. You can have that if you want. <laughs>